Hey, 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 welcome back to the Notcast. It is Thursday, 27th of June, 2024. It's Glastonbury weekend. I'm not there. And uh, today, uh, number 392, I am going to be talking about Britain's most overrated band. Yes, that's right. I said it. The Stone Roses, a band that have managed to quote the great Purchase Up Boys, make very little go a very, very long way. Now, this isn't to say that they aren't good, and it isn't to say that they don't have talent, and it isn't to say I don't love the music. It's just they only released two studio albums, the last one of which came out, out 30 years ago, and as recently as 2017, they were still playing and selling out four nights at a football stadium in Manchester, which, by the way, is, uh, in, in, in those four shows alone, 40 times as many people as saw them in Manchester on their 1995 tour. So that's a pretty staggering kind of statement, really. Um, and I'm, I'm going to take a little detour and talk about another band that's related to the Stone Roses as well, that some of you may not have heard about, but I'll get to that in a bit. Uh, really, I suppose, probably what, what's driving me to do this is the thing that I'm just about to come up to 1995, the, uh, the, the beige summer of Britpop on my episodes about pulp, uh, well about Blur and Oasis and uh, I am going to get to Pulp and obviously the Stone Roses were part of that as well and I've got into a couple of other ones that are get so I want to try and do is all the ones in the same or about the same period of time in history about 30 years ago and it some people I was talking to somebody at work today actually uh, who said they thought I was about 42 which is nice but not true I'm a little bit older than that um then maybe they're just lying to make me feel better. I don't know. Uh, but then I think, sometimes I think I was born 10 years too late and I should have been born in the 60s so I could have seen New Order in the 80s and the Smiths and I could have just about touched Joy Division and, and seen and experienced all of those things. But by the time that I got to them, I just missed them. And I just missed the glory years of the Stone Roses too. Because I started going to gigs in... July 1990, and the Stone Roses played their, their last show in their um, in their classic debut album era in June 1990. So, can't win them all, but some of them would be nice. I am wearing a Stone Roses t-shirt, uh, uh, as you know. Uh, this, I mean, this might probably the first time you've seen a yellow one, actually, in one of these. Uh, you'll probably think I have, I'm like uh, Jeff Goldblum in the fly and opens the wardrobe and it's just all identical black band t-shirts well no this one's yellow uh, i don't quite know why it's yellow but there it is i don't wear it too often probably because i bought it when i was thinner uh, and even though i've lost uh 28 pounds uh, since christmas uh, i'm still not the man I used to be, is probably the nice way of saying it. So starting off, Stone Roses, um, the first single uh, that was released in 1985 is one of only two Stone Roses singles I don't have. I don't have the first one, I don't have the last one. I have everything else multiple times because I am a sad record collector spot. You know I am. Uh, otherwise, why would I be doing this? It's uh, not for uh, fame and glory or fortune and glory kids, and it's certainly not for ball whips and fedora hats. Um, interestingly enough, I think that for a band that played together for so long in so many iterations, um, Stone Roses released remarkably little during their career. Uh, effectively, two studio albums, one compilation, uh, and one album which they didn't authorise the release of, The Garage Flower uh, CD, which was released in 1996. Effectively, this is the Roses' debut LP, uh, but they decided that they didn't want to release it, and so they didn't. The, the very first kind of roots of the band go back to 1979 uh, with a band called The Patrol, uh, which featured uh, John Squire, Ian Brown on bass, and uh, I think Simon Wollstonecroft on drums, who later went on to play very briefly in The Smiths and then later, and perhaps more better and more frequently, The Fall in one of their many, many lineups. I think The Fall have had as many lineups as The Wedding Present, actually, come to think of it, which I didn't think was humanly possible, but there you are. Um, Simon left the group because of they were, well, left the patrol because they were playing a lot of material that was fast, unsubtle, uh, and very much had an oi element to it. Um, and, and obviously when you're young and starting off in a band and you're in the rehearsal room next to the band that plays Metallica covers, you've got to compete with that. You've got to play music that, that can be heard 
over the roar and the din of yet another band playing yet another fucking version, pardon me, of uh, Enter Sandman. And having been in a band next to a uh, Metallica's covered band, I can confirm they are loud as heck. I was also in a room next to Napalm Death and they were loud as heck, but actually good, which made a nice change. Um, in terms of recorded material, I don't know if the, I don't think the Patrol re issued anything. I don't think the Waterfront, which is another band which they were related to, uh, did anything. And the band just kind of petered out a little bit. There's probably some bootleg tapes going around of the Patrol. And Ian Brown was was kind of out of music for a while uh, until um, Gino Washington met him at a party and said, "You should be a pop star. You've got the looks. You've got the personality." You're, 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 a, you're a talent, or a, you know that type of thing, and that was a that was a kind of thing where suddenly you kind of think, okay, maybe somebody's right. Um, I think Ian was asked to sing in the Patrol, but he didn't do it, um, and John Squire picked up a guitar, and he was inspired by the Sex Pistols Anarchy in the UK, and. Then after that conversation with Gino, Ian asked Squire if uh, if they'd played together, and uh, John said uh, only if Pete Garner uh, was on bass. And Pete was in the Roses, I think, between 1983 and 1987, and it was his departure in 1987 that I think really pulled the band in the direction that they needed to go in. Uh, of course, at this point, like a lot of bands, they were big locally, not very big anywhere else. Uh, and when Rennie really joined the group, um, the band's drummer. Um, he suddenly the band propelled themselves into being far far better than they actually were. Now I have a theory about drummers, which is a bad drummer will hold a band back, and a good drummer will propel a band into the stratosphere. You think of bands that have bad drummers, uh, and then you think about bands that have good drummers. The drummer is always the weak point. Uh, Tony McCarroll in Oasis, perfectly competent drummer, but not the best man to play in Oasis. It's certainly not the material that went on What's the Story, Morning Glory, which will be coming up in a future episode. Um, Lowell Tolhurst, again, the section where he was at the peak of his abilities was probably the, the, the section where he just about uh, uh, intersected with, with what the Cure could, could work with and so turned his limitations into talents. Uh, Rennie is undoubtedly one of the finest drummers I have ever seen. And maybe I should do an episode about my favourite drummers, which means I won't tell you the thought that's exactly on my mind, which I have a ranking of my favourite drummers in the year, in the world. Some alive, some dead, most of whom I've had the good pleasure to see play live at some point in my life. Um, Rennie was a metalhead, and he joined the Roses after they placed an advert. Um, and he was in a band, I think, called Tora Tora. Um, and Tora Tora's drummer was a guy called Simon Wright. Simon Wright, you may not have heard of until I mentioned the phrase ACDC. Uh, he, Simon Wright replaced Phil Rudd in ACDC until he left in 1988. And uh, Simon Wright also, I think, played with Dio and Rainbow and some other acts. So really being a metalhead, you wouldn't necessarily have known that from listening to his play because his, his playing is very fluid, very funky. It's, uh, it's fantastic. It's like listening to a whole orchestra on the drums alone. That's, I might get to that later, actually, in another episode. Um, but you kind of put those four influences together. You put uh, John influenced by um, Sex Pistols Anarchy in the UK. Uh, you put Andy Cousins in the band on guitar. So there was a two guitar lineup. Um, Pete uh, Garner on bass, Ian Brown on vocals, who perhaps it's fair to say may have had the star quality but didn't have the biggest or most reliable life dynamic range of any vocalist I've ever heard. Um, and you suddenly have a band which on paper you'd look at and go, that doesn't work. You know, a metalhead and a punk and some guy that's into, you know, funk and stuff and you stick them all together and, and then suddenly you kind of go, but it works. It really works. Uh, although it's not immediately apparent when you listen to Garage Flower or, in fact, the band's first single, uh, which was So Young, backed with Tell Me. And uh, So Young and Tell Me first got a CD release in 1995. On this compilation album, The Complete Stone Roses, it is less than amazing. This this is all the 7-inch uh, A and B sides of the band between 1985 and 1990. Um, it's, a, it's a fair body of work, it's fair to say, and quite interesting and quite good. Uh, but it's not exactly um, the most amazing album ever made. This is a German promo copy, which for some reason has uh, a BMG 
uh, hype thingy in there. No idea why. Uh, and it was released in 1995 to kind of capitulate upon the revived interest in the band uh, when they released their final studio record, um, The Second Coming. So for a long period of time, So Young and Tell Me was very difficult to get. Um, I could probably pick up a copy, copy if I had a couple of hundred quid. Uh, and I do have a couple of hundred quid, uh, but I'm not going to spend it on a record that's not particularly good. And the Martin Hannett recordings, the first fruits of which were heard on this, and the second uh, and, and the other songs from the session were on Garage Flower, are not very good at all. So approximately a thousand copies of So Young were printed and sold. Uh, it was produced by Martin Hannett, recorded in um, or released in September 1985. And it was So Young's originally titled Misery Dictionary, uh, but they changed it because they thought the title was too similar to the Smiths and contemporaries such as New Order and James and, and, and bands like that. There was the idea of it being, you know, frankly, shit indie bollocks or perhaps, you know, sensitive music for white boys uh, with guitars who are sad about their girlfriends, uh, which I know, by the way, I've just outed almost all of my record collection. Please don't judge me. Um, although, as Natalie Haynes said, I think it is only the evolved that, uh, that, that truly judge people. Um, I think it might be misquoting Oscar Wilde there, but I'm not quite sure. And this was uh, So Young and Tell Me was only released on CD in 1992 as part of the Silvertone CD singles box set. I will talk in more detail further on in the story about uh, quite possibly the worst record deal in the history of mankind, i.e. the one between Stone Roses and Silvertone, but not just yet. And when So Young and Tell Me was, was getting ready to be released, uh, the decision was made that the publishing for the songs was just going to be Squire and Brown. There wasn't going to be any other members of the band listed on the writing credits, which, as we know, creating an artificial hierarchy inside a band will tear a band apart. Um, this is why you two split their publishing four ways, because even though each one of them perhaps doesn't write all of the songs, um, it stops any financial inequalities in the band, it stops any arguments. You know, when you're all in a, a van, kind of, and it's four of you and you're driving across America for 4,000 days in a row, the last thing you need is to know that some guys have claimed to write the songs and then because they've spent the time writing the songs, they get paid more money than you even though you may not have written the songs, but you've done all the hours in the van. Uh, that's why R.E.M. split their, their music four ways. That's why U2 split their music four ways. Uh, Queen didn't, hence there's discussions around that. Or more correctly, even John Deacon, the man that wrote the, probably the lowest number of Queen songs, is still staggeringly rich. Maybe that's a bad example. But Roger Taylor having I'm in love with my car on the B-side of Bohemian Rhapsody meant that Roger Taylor became as rich as Freddie Mercury for the release of the Bohemian Rhapsody single in 1975. And that just exacerbated the financial inequalities that existed in the band. And I, I think crediting the songs to Squire and Brown is unfair in the same way that I think that crediting songs to Morrissey Marr is, is probably unfair and, and undersells the contribution that were made by the drummer and the bass player. Um, and so after that came out, um, Rennie and Andy Cousins left the group for six weeks in a dispute. Uh, but they decided in the end that it was better to go with what they had than what they hadn't, if that makes sense. Um, the first time the public heard the Stone Roses, apart from, you know, a couple of small shows, was I think when they played uh, live in Piccadilly in Manchester on the 12th of January, 1985, which was broadcast on the radio. And they, they played uh, Heart on the Staves, which I don't think has come out. It might be on this record. Uh, and they, they played uh, an early version of I Want to Be Adored and a version of Tell Me, uh, which is circulating. Then they did, for somewhat bizarre reason, a Swedish tour in 1985. Um, and then it all kind of fell apart a little bit, really. Um, they, they didn't want to sign to Factory. Um, and I think the quote from Andy Cousins is, we were very anti-Factory, anti-Hacienda. Uh, uh, James Anderson Anderton, who was God's cop, uh, the head of the Manchester Police Force uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, shut everything about this one place. And it was a dump, uh, is what he said. And so the band weren't going to sign to Factory in a gazillion thousand trillion years. Uh, and they didn't. In 1986, they signed to a record label called The Thin Line, which was made out of people that used to work for Factory, but weren't actually Factory. But that is another story, and we'll get to that shortly. 
So the first album, this Garage Flower uh, is the Stone Roses' first record. It's the record that they didn't want to release. It occupies a similar place in the body of work to the album Warsaw by Joy Division, an aborted debut album that didn't quite hit the targets that they wanted it to. Uh, Ian Brown bought the multi-tracks from it, blocked the release of it, um, although the Martin Hammett mixes, uh, which belong to the estate of Martin Hammett due to some um, contractual uh, copyright vagaries, uh, were bought, licensed and issued in 1996, which is the only reason that the Garage, Garage Flower album has come out. When Garage Flower was released, um, I think Rennie, Andy and Pete went over to the record label owner's house and uh, he had to call the police and get them to remove Because even though it was completely legal, it wasn't necessarily uh, ethical is probably the right way to describe it. Um, it's it, this, is, this is basically a lost album. Uh, it barely exists uh, and is barely recognised in the band's body of work. Um, and to be fair, you listen to it and you completely understand why it is raw, it is weirdly produced, because all of Martin Hammett's stuff is weirdly produced. Um, it's got a very distinctive, very boxy sound that sounds like the, you know, the sound of being trapped inside a lift on a housing estate in Salford in the mid-80s. And it was a lot like Motorhead's On Parole as well, uh, an album made by a version of the band that... that the band were never happy with. And some of the material on this later reappeared on the debut album. So on, on this one, for example, we had, uh, and let me quickly check, I Want to Be Adored, This Is The One, uh, and then So Young and Tell Me, which appeared on the, um, on, on the single. So effectively, So Young and Tell Me were two tracks exerted from, the, from this album and released as a single in their own rights. But The Roses outgrew that. And even though they kept a couple of the songs and used them on the debut album, they outgrew the songs, and a lot of these, uh, Getting Plenty, Tragic Roundabout, for example, Heart on the Staves, All I Want, um, Fall, oh, there's one called Haddock, which is awful, uh, Mission Impossible, they all kind of fell by the wayside. Um, and what we did have is effectively what feels like primitive baby pictures of the band. If you want to know what made the Stone Roses great, this is not the album to go for. Not releasing this was exactly the right decision for the band to make at the time. Because in the band's official body of work, you only have two albums. You have the Stone Roses and you have the second comic. Turns into Stone is a compilation. This is, is kind of seen as a, a kind of, you know, dodgy bootleg cut version of it. And before this was released, by the way, there are a lot of Roses bootlegs that were going around, dubbed from radio sessions, dubbed from tapes uh, in the, uh, in, in, uh, that were broadcast on the radio in the 80s. One of which, by the way, is the first coming. Uh, this isn't the cover to the first coming, or it is, actually it is the cover to the first coming. The first coming uh, being one of the, the, the very best and well-known uh, Roses bootleg CDs that came out in 1990. This features um, a lot of the songs which were recorded for the Martin Hannett sessions. Um, the first nine songs, well, the first eight songs, so Young, Mission Impossible, Nowhere Fast, Trust of Facts, All I Want, Getting Plenty and Heart on the Staves and I Want to Be Adored. Um, and then there were alternate mixes of Waterfall, Elephant Stone, uh, Shoot You Down, This Is The One, Song For My Sugar Spun Sister, a song called The Sun Still Shines, which has still not been released, Going Down, and some live tracks recorded in lovely Walsall, my least favourite place in Britain, uh, at Junction 10 on June the 3rd, 1989. Uh, for a long time, Releases like this were the only place to get the material uh, that was from the Martin Hanna album. And so, of course, being the uh, the geeky, spotty record collector guy that I am, yeah, I bought it because, hey, who, who, who wouldn't? Um, and it, it's pretty good. Personally, if I was the band, I think I would have bootlegged the bootleggers and stuck this one out. But uh, no one, no one, I don't get any say in that. Quite rightly so, too. Uh, so, so young and tell me get on the complete stone roses and uh, if you want to get garage flower i think it's easily available on cd and ridiculously hard to get on vinyl because uh, it was only pressed once in 1996 no one was buying vinyl in 1996 uh, copies start on discogs in something like 70 80 pounds and they only get more ridiculous after that i think there was a gentleman's agreement not to repress the album after a certain period of time and so it's disappeared uh, from the world it is apparently uh, and maybe one of the reasons the band didn't want to release it is because it was a difficult recording. Martin often fell asleep 
uh, he overproduced the drum sound. The drums are huge in this. Uh, apparently John Squire re-recorded the bass lines as well because he thought that they were, he could do a better job of it. But the sound is, is unforgiving. The sound has a threatening intensity to it. It's very claustrophobic. Uh, it is, it's like the difference between, let's say, uh, New Order's Low Life and Joy Division's Unknown Pleasures. You know, one is wide and open, the other one is claustrophobic and close. And it feels like, to me at least, when I listen to it, it's kind of got that edge of barely contained violence and rage, which is very similar to what happens if you walk the streets of some towns on a Friday night at chucking out time, or at least if you did when I was in, uh, in, in my teens uh, in the 90s. And, and whilst Brown had bought the multi-tracks, but he hadn't bought the Hannett mixes, uh, what he tried to do was to prevent this stuff from coming out. It's like, you know, if you have a bad haircut, yes, I've had bad haircuts. You may not think it because of my hair, but I have had some terrible haircuts. Uh, and luckily, uh, there is no photographic evidence of most of those, especially when I was trying to grow my hair long and got it down to my bum, um, which means that uh, you will never see it, which is quite good. Um, and sometimes you just get embarrassed by things that have happened. So this, this album cost Thin Line Records eleven thousand pounds and uh they didn't they didn't have eleven thousand pounds uh so it wasn't released um rough trade weren't interested they wouldn't sign with factory uh effectively the album w was was lost because of because that money to press the physical copies of the lp didn't exist and i don't think the roses were heartbroken about that because they weren't entirely satisfied with it either a situation not dissimilar to motorheads on parole uh, and then in 1986 and late 1985, after this was recorded, uh, they wrote some extra songs that really kind of pushed the band forward into the next direction. Um, Andy left the group in 1986, and sometimes what you take out is just as important as what you include. And somehow, instead of having to fill the lines or fill the sound with two guitar lines, um, it then kind of simplified the songs to make them not more elegant, but less busy, to so focus more on for example, rhythm and then solos, as opposed to having to put rhythm guitar over and then put solos as well and double up, for example. Uh, and at that point, um, they wrote Sally Cinnamon, All Across the Sands, uh, Sugar Spun Sister. I think they wrote um, Here It Comes, Where Angels Play. Um, and then in summer 1986, they added Waterfall, Going Down, Mersey Paradise and Elephant Stone to their set lists. Uh, the Razors were never the most prolific band in the world. Now people go, why did it take four years, five years to release the second coming? Well, it's because they didn't write that many songs. You know, they wrote three, four, five songs a year, maybe. And then an album is 10 songs, 11 songs, plus your bees. Suddenly that means it's three, four years of songwriting between albums, even at their most prolific. And they were never that kind of band. You know, they weren't able to do a Johnny Moore and sit down and write Girl Afraid and... Uh, what is it? Please, please, please let me get what I want and how soon is now all on the same night on the same guitar, for example. That just wasn't how they worked at all. So this, this sound of the band um, was effectively replaced by, by the sound that, that happened in 1987. And in 1987, uh, the band offered them, thir well, more correctly, the band had two deals on the table. They also had a bit of a dodgy manager, actually. Uh, which again is a, is a frequent downfall of many a great band is having a dodgy manager. Um, they released their second single, Sally Cinnamon, in May 1987. This one has been reissued 4,272 times since then. Uh, it got to number three in the indie charts um, and it was recorded before Manny joined. So this is you know, the single that you'll know uh, with Pete on bass. And um, they signed to a manager called Gareth Evans, who would be the band's undoing for many years. Uh, Andy Cousins' dad paid for the for the recording, uh, uh, paid for the lawyer actually to check the contract and said, guys, you shouldn't sign this, but they did anyway. Um, and Evans offered the band £10,000 for Pete, got Pete to leave. And he didn't. Um, and also the manager took 33% of the band's gross profit, according to the book War and Peace. Um, but what had happened is that the rest of the band had moved forward musically. Brian was a much better singer than he used to be. Uh, Rennie had been practicing a lot, became a much better drummer. John Squire had become a much more fluid and proficient um, guitarist. Pete hadn't. And he 
could see in his eyes that he was holding the band back a little bit, I think was, was what he said. And so he decided to leave. And uh, the band got a, a guy called Mannion on bass. Um, and with that, suddenly the four pieces of the classic Roses lineup had fallen into place. Now, there are two versions of Sally Cinnamon, by the way. Uh, there is a 1987 recording, uh, which is a, a single version of it. And then there was a remix that appears on the 1989 12 inch. I think this is the 1989 12 inch. Uh, on the grounds that it's got a barcode on the back. Um, and the 1987 remix is slightly longer as well. So it appears on the video version of the song. It appears on the CD single of the song, uh, which this is, um, yeah, Rev XD 36, which let me just quickly check the copyright dates. It still says it's 1987. Um, and this was on a, a label called, and let me quickly check, FM Records, uh, which was a mostly metal label out of Wolverhampton, which of course, if you're going to have a metal label anywhere in the world, it's going to be Wolverhampton, isn't it? Because Wolverhampton is near Birmingham. Birmingham is where I grew up. And uh, the Midlands are where Black Sabbath, Led Zeppelin, Judas Priest and Napalm Death have come from. So of course, metal is in Birmingham's bones, uh, much like Wolverine has uh, metal in his skeleton. Uh, the band only played 10 shows in 1987. Uh, and four were at the Manchester International, uh, which I think was owned by Gareth, and the band rehearsed in the basement there as well. So effectively, it was just moving up, the, moving the gear up the stairs and down the stairs. Um, and they were selling, you know, considerable numbers of tickets at that point. But then they'd go to, uh, let's say, Liverpool or Stafford, and they'd play to like eighteen people, which is a bizarre way of thinking about it. So they were a big band in Manchester, but not a big band anywhere else. And as I've said before, uh, Sally Cinnamon exists in two versions. So we have uh, the 1989 extended single remix version, which is on these two releases, the CD singles and the 12 inch singles from 1989. We have the original seven inch mix, which is on uh, at two minutes 50 on the complete Stone Roses. And we also have uh, multiple versions of, and let me quickly check, uh, one of the B-sides all across the sand. So if you look at this version, it says all across the sand on the vinyl. On the CD, it says all across the sands, um, uh, which is a bizarre kind of way of looking at it. Uh, but so it is apparently the 1989 issue of the track, this one here, has backing vocals on and the original version doesn't. So again, two mixes of the track. Here it comes is the only song that's on here that isn't available in alternate mixes and the alternate mixes aren't on, on anything else. So if you want to get both versions of Sally Cinnamon, you have to get the 1989 12 inch or CD single and you have to get the complete Stone Roses as well. Uh, just to make things difficult for you. Uh, and I think one of those versions was released by mistake and the label themselves hadn't even noticed. On the 19th of September, 1986, um, Gareth signed them to FM Records in Wolverhampton for £10,000 and hence Sally Cinnamon was released. Later on that day, A&M offered the band £30,000. And uh, Gareth declined on the grounds that they already signed a contract. You're a shit manager, mate. Shit manager. And that was where the start of everything went wrong. Because uh, uh, rather than wait a few hours, they signed, uh, they, did as a, uh, they did as they thought was the right thing to do. Took 10k and left 20k on the table. Which is, which is an awful thing. Very, very frustrating. And undoubtedly puts you in a position as a band where you kind of go so close. The world could have been very different if the band had been signed to a &M. We could have not had any of the contractual fuffling with Silvertone. We might not have had multiple really awful um, unauthorised single releases. It could have been a very different world, uh, but instead um, it was blown. And uh, I, I hold part of that responsibility firmly at the feet of the band's manager for mismanaging the band and doing a bad job of it. Manny joined the group and he was influenced by uh, James Jameson, who is one of Motown's session bass players and Paul Simonian of uh, The Clash. And when you hear his bass playing, uh, especially on things like Elephant Stone, She Bangs the Drums, Love Spreads, live versions of Falls Gold, you can completely see where it comes from. And it's glorious, actually. He's a great bass player. I think he's great. And he's the best thing that happened to Primal Scream. And when he left Primal Scream, um, well, that was, a, that was a sad day for Primal Scream, but not for Manny and not for his bank account. 
I did say I'd mention another band that's related to the Stone Roses. What happened to Andy Cousins, who was on guitar? Well, Andy um, uh, formed another band, and the band were called The High. I rated The High very, very highly indeed. I never got a chance to see them. I had tickets to see them, uh, but they cancelled due to poor ticket sales, which I didn't know. Uh, they cancelled at Birmingham University, I think it was the 19th of May, 1991. And they cancelled due to poor ticket sales, which I only found out about when I actually wandered about the interior of Birmingham University to try and find the venue, to find that the gig had been pulled and there'd nobody anywhere and put anything up about it. So I was wandering around going, oh, great, I'm going to go and see the high. I w w got the bus, got the 11 over to the university. No gig, no news. And I was like, oh... And I didn't think I was like into, you know, songs about Ukrainian tractor farmers played on the Ballylika. I thought I was a fairly mainstream kind of dude, but they didn't sell enough tickets to make the gig happen. So I never got to see the high. And I still haven't. I probably never will. And, and so be it. But um, the high made one album somewhere soon. They made a second album called Hype that wasn't officially released. Um, and like, like the Stone Roses, the first version of their album uh, was recorded by Martin Hannett, which was released in this limited edition CD box set and Record Store Day vinyl release a few years ago. This is the Martin Hannett sessions of The High. They did one album, and if you sit around and think, I'd love to hear something that sounds like the Stone Roses' first album, if you listen to The High's Somewhere Soon record uh, or the Martin Hannett sessions, you can hear the, the melodic chiming indie sides of of the roses so you can hear songs that kind of like feel feel like you know relations and cousins of, of mersey paradise made of stone elephant stone those type of things but with a slightly more melancholic edge to them somewhere soon is, is one of the great lost albums of the 1990s in my opinion not enough people know this band not enough people like the band not enough people liked the band at the time uh, this you can probably pick up Second hand for 17p on CD on Amazon. Not sure how much the vinyl goes for. But if someone wants to go, that's a Stone Roses cover, you'd look at it and go, yeah, it probably is actually, come to think of it. And uh, the, uh, the, the relevant label, London, put a lot of money into this, thinking that they could get, you know, a, kind of like passive smoking, they could get passive success. Uh, on, the, on the back of the Stone Rose is being enormous, going, hey, we've got an ex-Stone Rose. Well, it didn't quite work like that. The high didn't really last particularly long. Um, they, they didn't sell a huge number of records. I think their biggest headline show was for about 800 people outside of Manchester. Uh, but the Somewhere Soon album is pretty good, actually. I like it. It's a, a, a lost indie classic of the era. Um, as I've said, they did a number of other releases. Their first single, Box Set Go came out in 1990, was broadcast on television. That's where I heard it, and I was like, oh, this is good. And the B side of Box Set Go, PWA, is glorious. It's, it's, you listen to it and go, ah, oh, that could be an amazing Roses song. But it wasn't. Uh, and then there was Up and Down, which was pretty amazing as well. Um, there's the CD edition of Somewhere Soon. Uh, box set go got a reissue on CD and 12 inch uh, featuring some of the Martin Hannett recordings and uh, actually come to think of it I have that 12 inch here box set go and as you can see London Records were making a loss on that because they were selling a gatefold I think it's a gatefold 12 inch for 99p they really went to town on the on the formatting here um, this is the kind of uh, deluxe and committed approach which the roses could really have benefited from as opposed to the perfunctory releases by silvertone which always got the sense of oh we'll stick it out because we've absolutely got to we don't really expect you to sell any copies um, and so the high were one of the great underrated bands of of the 90s in my opinion uh, and then as i said before uh, a few years ago, Vinyl Re Revival Records in Manchester released the uh, special Martin Hannett Sessions uh, box set edition, which features the Martin Hannett Sessions and uh, a bunch of live tracks and, and a bunch of alternate takes and alternate mixes uh, in a CD. Um, listen to this band on YouTube if you like them. Oh, what great delights you have ahead of you. Uh, and if you don't like them, brilliant. One less band for you to listen to. Uh, but uh, I strongly recommend it. Everything changed for the Roses when Manny joined. They took 
as I said, sometimes you just need to chip away at a lineup until you get the right configuration of everything. With, uh, with Andy leaving, um, I think it, uh, it freed up John to be able to take a more intricate approach to his guitars um, with, uh, with, 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 with Pete going, Manny joined and, and Manny is, let's be honest, shit hot bass player. Absolutely great. Doesn't get enough recognition because like, uh, like Andy Rook, uh, Manny's bass lines are leads and Manny's bass lines are, are almost like second leads in their own that, that kind of duet with, with Squire's guitar lines and really elevated the band into something which perhaps I hadn't expected them to be. Um, that is the next episode though, when I talk about the Stone Roses, their, their debut album and what comes next. What I will say is if you are if you only ever listen to um, the Stone Roses and the, uh, the second coming album and turn into stone, do give Garage Flower uh, a listen, uh, try it. Now, what you will get with Garage Flower, you won't get perfection. You won't get a finished product. You won't get the roses the way that perhaps you might you might expect them to be. Um, you'll get a prototype version of the band, the early years, something that's as similar to, to modern day or, or contemporary roses as perhaps you would get to, uh, for example, the gap between Piper at the Gates of Dawn and Dark Side of the Moon. But it's an important part of the band's evolution. Really interesting to listen to, uh, and you can see in the eyes of the puppy. The, uh, the dog that they were going to become. Maybe not dog. But sometimes when you see somebody and go, I, only I think this about my kids actually, which is really nice is that I see them and I kind of go, I know the person you're going to be. I can see the person you're becoming. And it's really lovely. Um, and in Garage Flower, it's a really interesting look into perhaps an alternate future that didn't come to pass of the Stone Roses. Right. I've now come to the conclusion it's utterly ridiculous uh, to do a knock cast like this in this weather whilst I am basically melting like the witch in The Wizard of Oz. I'm melting because it's incredibly hot up here uh, and I'm going to have to stop and have a nice cool ice lolly. And if you are anywhere that is warm, switch the aircon on and uh, have an ice lolly. Uh, and don't forget, in the words of Dale Cooper, every day, once a day, don't plan it. Do something nice to yourself. It might be a nice cup of coffee, but always treat yourself. So be kind to yourself and to others. Uh, stay beautiful, beautiful ones, and see you all soon. Okay, I'm going to go and have an ice lol, and you can do it too. But in your house, don't come to my house, because that would just be weird. All right, bye.